Now on BBC One, Riaz Khan tries to answer one of life's toughest questions. Who's looking after mum and dad? I was no model son. Growing up in Leicester, I was a nightmare for my mum and dad. I was a football hooligan. But a lot has changed since then. I've turned things around. Today, I'm an author. I'm a lecturer. They've even made my life into a play. Check this out. And this is all down to my parents never giving up on me. But now, the roles are reversed. I find myself worrying about my elderly parents. As a British Asian, I believe it's my duty to look after them. And a care home is not an option. But it's hard work. No lie about it, but I did every two weekends. Two I weekends, think you're yeah. getting dementia No, as no, well. Yasmin, you're wrong. People underestimate the pressures that are put on families to look after parents at home. It's really difficult and you get arguments all the time. It's not just my family. Elderly care raises difficult questions for us all. The most important one, who's looking after mum and dad? The elderly care system aims to keep us in our homes for as long as possible. But as our population ages rapidly, the NHS and social services are struggling to keep us there. Dad. There you go, Dad. There, that's it. Even when there's a big family to help, caring for Mum and Dad is a challenge. From seeing them strong, talkative, healthy, you know, even having a laugh and a joke with you, you sort of revert back to being a baby, don't you? You end up looking after them, taking them to the toilet, feeding them. When we were kids, they were doing the same thing for us, so it kind of reverts back to us helping them out now. He was diagnosed with dementia in uh, February 2013. He started showing signs 2012. Do you remember when we wrote down things for him to 2012 is 2011, 2012, he started. It was mild, it? Yeah, it was mild. It was forgetful things, like he forgot to lock the door behind him when he goes out of the house, or he left the cooker on that time, do you remember? Or the shower on. Just simple little things which you think, please let it just be old age. You know, before he used to be really respondent, now he's not. You know, he's not. No one can prepare you for this. Sing it, Jude. Dad's care is the most urgent, and we're all worried he's not got long left. And at the same time, mum's health is getting worse. We feel it's our duty to look after them in their own home. My parents were there for us, so to put them in a home to get looked after by somebody else is a travesty. I think it shouldn't happen. Dad, have something to drink. But it's difficult. Have you got a straw? Yeah. As they're not themselves anymore. We used to scrap with us all the time. We'd take them to the toilet, be like, oh, get off, no! And then you feel embarrassed, because it's, it's, you know, embarrassing to take them to a grown man to the toilet. To see someone who was proud and a warrior type man to become, you know, a completely different person and became vulnerable and insecure and aggressive, it, it killed us. I would never put my dad in a care home. Even if I was a single child, I'd never do it. It was 1970s because of colour photos as well. Now and again, I think back to how it used to be. Look at her there, 1970s, look at his beetle. Look at Dad there, look at that last 60s there. Look how young, look handsome, look there, look. He wanted me to be a doctor, definitely. He wanted my sister to be like Ben Zibuto, a lawyer, and he wanted my brother, Yusuf, to be a pilot, and my two younger brothers, I don't know what he wanted them to be. My dad was born in Pakistan and he was in the Navy before coming to the UK back in the late 50s. Today, he's a shadow of his former self, but we did have good times. One of the funniest things was when we went to Skegness, my dad said, let's go to the seaside, let's go to the beach. We thought, yes, kids went, all piled into our Volkswagen Beetle, drove all the way to Skegness, took us hours to get there. 
As soon as we got there, my dad looked around and goes, okay, there's a, the there's a beach, there's a sea, let's go. For hey, what, we just got here, dad? No, no, we're going back in the car and going. We didn't realize at the time that the beach was full of skinheads. And in those days, a lot of racism. It's all right, dad. Eve's the best, honestly. Dad taught me how to cook, not my mum. <coughs> And he's had a chest, they said he had a throat infection. Oh, Aslam, how are you doing? You good? Long time, man. Despite all the difficulties looking after mum and dad, for our family, a care home is not a place where you end up. And many Asian families I know feel the same. Nice. Oh, Aslam, how are you doing? Long time. Yeah. I've come to need celebration in Leicester to find out why we think like this. In Islam, we've always been taught, like from a young age, is that we should look after our parents as they looked after us when, when we was young. Um, so we should do the same and respect them. It's in our culture to look after older people and elders. I think oh, putting parents in a home is still, there is still a stigma to it. So was it difficult for you to look after your mother-in-law? In the beginning it was, but then as gradually you get used to it. Past, uh, 33 years. 33 years you looked after, after her? yeah. Wow, how long did she live for? She lived till 102. 102? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Here in Britain, our culture remains strong, despite many other changes in the way we live and work. Now I've been touching another Asian family who, like myself, are looking after their parents at home regardless of personal cost. Now to even mention or even talk about a care home is a taboo subject in this household. Thank you. How are you doing? You okay? <laughs> Rabia and her mum, Najima, take it in turns caring for her grandmother, who has dementia, just like my dad. She juggles this with a full-time job, but it's taken its toll on her personal life as she's often away from her husband. So she looked after you when you was young? Yes. So now that she's older, you're looking after her? Yes. So yes. you'd never put in a care home, would you? We're not brought up like that. We will work around my nan for however long it takes, no matter how hard it is. So how does caring for your grandparents affect you and your husband, your relationship? Profoundly. Uh, and I, I say that because not being able to give your spouse the quality time that you want because at the back of your mind you've got to be taking care of somebody is incredibly difficult um, no matter how much you love somebody and I deeply deeply love my nan and respect her and will continue to make my life revolve around her but is it easy no is it difficult very Rabia says her care duties affect everything from how she holidays to where she can work and even buy her first house. That's a huge sacrifice for a young woman like herself, looking after her grandmother. Her life's on hold. But it's her duty at the end of the day. She sees it as her duty. I would say that, you know, if you can look after your parents, do look after your parents. I mean, I know that in life there are so many other responsibilities as well. But I think, you know, if, if, if you can keep them and look after them, you know, you should make those sacrifices. It's the best thing that you can do. This arrangement is not going to work for everyone, as many families live miles apart from each other. Hey, good to see you, sir. Sorry, bro. I've known Stefan from my football days as teenagers. His dad lives in Cumbria, a seven hour drive from his home in London. I know he gets up there with his kids as often as he can. That's an early photograph of you and your family, isn't it? That's your mum, yeah. there's you, and there's, there's dad, me. and there's your sister. That's when mum, dad, and my sister took me on. I just got fostered and about to be adopted in 1973. So that's the very, actually, this is the very first family picture that was ever taken. All right. As they're together. Just like my dad, Stefan's mum, Rini, had dementia. I want to ask him about her last few years. So, you decided to put her in a home, didn't you? You know, I'm in London, 
sisters in London, the wider family is all not so far. And to be honest with you, because of the nature of how it aggressively became, you know, there wasn't an immediate support network. The, the people on the street were brilliant, but when mum really started to get ill, basically they came in and said, look, dad, Trevor, if you don't put her into her home, then you'll end up in, being sick yourselves. In my family structure, we made it work. You could have done the same. It wasn't feasible, mate. I mean, Why? both me, the wider family, myself, my sister, don't live anywhere near here. We're seven and a half hours away in London. So for some people it'll work. For us, it just wasn't the case. Rini was 80 when she died. And you know what? I can see how difficult it was for my mate to move her into a care home and even tougher for his dad. I felt in some ways I'd failed her. Although I knew that it was a sensible decision because I was on the verge of collapse anyway. Yeah. And not only did they look after your mum, they looked after me. Yeah. And I can only say, well, it was a good decision. In the end, the decision, it was the right decision. It was perfect decision. Yeah. Even though she was enclosed by the disease towards the end, her last thing was to be free. And that's why we brought her here, really, wasn't it? This would always be a special place for them. Rini's ashes were scattered here. So a care home was right for them. But I've got a tricky question to ask Stefan. Looking back, would he have done things differently? Nobody wants to put their parents into that kind of scenario. But for us, it was just, it was a necessity, both in terms of the family network and just to the, the level of her illness. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that was the only way we could do it. Back in Leicester, things are falling apart. My dad died in the night. And while we all knew it was coming, it's still a terrible shock. We just couldn't believe it. It's like disbelief. And when it sunk in, in that first 10 minutes, then it was just very, very emotional. You know, and then it's just been like the first, the first few hours in the morning, when we actually saw him, saw him and he was dead. It was just... I can't describe it, it was horrible. It was hard, it was difficult. I mean, you've known him all your life and then you see him gone. And it's, it's, um, I know him about 52 years of my life and uh, yeah, it was... It was always his wish. He stayed at home until the very end. And despite all the difficulties, we managed to make it happen. Yeah, it did make it easy for us. My dad was at home because he died in, you know, surroundings that I was used to. So it, that was nice not in a hospital or in some care home, you know. That did make it a little bit easier. While everyone's mourning, I know it's hit my mum especially hard. She wasn't even well enough to come to the funeral. So much has changed. She was such a strong woman, a force to be reckoned with when we were young. She was an aggressive woman, but she was very overprotective over us. As well as the family looking after her, she has carers to help, but still spends most days in bed watching Bollywood movies. 
Uh, mum has to care of four times a day, is it? Yeah. Four times a day, she's got uh, diabetes, arthritis, high cholesterol, numerous illnesses. All of this puts pressure on me and my sister Yasmin. My marriage has kind of like been on hold for the last five years. And my husband's been great about it because he knows how, how much my family means to me. And they are my paramount responsibility. And they are a responsibility. Your parents are a responsibility. But yeah, it's had an impact. Were they Punjabi? My sister's always been the rock of the family. I wish I could say the same. As a teenager, I was a tearaway. I was a hooligan. I was a, you know, I was a, not a good son at all. I mean, they went through hell with me and my, you know, and my lifestyle. They went through hell. Let me come clean about my past. Growing up in Leicester in the 70s and 80s was tough. Initially, there was a lot of racism, the National Front were getting big, so it was tough being a brown person or a black person. But then, when I got involved in the casual scene, it was better because that sort of got rid of all the racism. Because you were Leicester, we was one body. The football made me who I am. But I do have one big regret. I got into instant in Torquay with a knife. Looking back now, I regret what I did. But at the time, it was, it was, we was in a club. We got into altercation with some older men and I used my knife and I ended up going to prison for it. I feel indebted to my parents because they supported me all that time. All those months I was in prison, they supported me, writing me letters, sending me money, buying me food, coming to visit me. It was, it was a 600 mile trip, 300 miles there, 300 miles back. And every Saturday they'd come and see me, my father and my mother. You know, it was, what can I say? That sense of guilt has now become a strong sense of duty. Being stuck in the house all day, I'm not surprised my mum gets bored and frustrated. She's lost her independence. There's plenty of pressure on us and the cracks are starting to show. I did three weekends in a row. You did one. No. But, yeah. No, I, when was I it, first, I was it, no, when it was I, only yeah. two weekends. No. Yes, it I was, Yasmin. No. Flipping age, if I'm going to say you took three weeks, I did one week in a month. That's rubbish. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. You did all the phone because you did all this, that's medicine. No lie about it. But I did every two weekends. It was well, every two I, weekends. I think you're yeah. getting to No, as no, well. Yasmin, you're wrong. Trust me. What, what days did I do then, if that's, if that's the case? Then no days at all. People underestimate the pressures that are put on families to look after parents at home. It's really difficult and you get arguments all the time, as you've seen. Dad's been gone six months, but I still talk to him all the time. We seem a little bit lost now, and especially with Mum, we don't know what to do with Mum. I mean, she's just lying there all day and her life is really just getting from worse to worse. You're not around now to help us, to advise us what we can do, so I wish she was here. Mum's care is playing on my mind. I've been so judgmental about care homes, but I've never even been in one. Would it be better for my mum? and take some of the pressure off us. Wow, this place is amazing, look at it. Hi, Rabia. Rabia, who I met earlier, is also having a tough time with her grandmother. So I've brought her with me to this home, which caters for Asian people. It smells that? nice there as well. You can smell it. The rooms are quite big. Really fresh. Flat screen TV. Big beds. Mm-hmm. I like the ethnic Asian pictures as well. Mm. Not what I was expecting. Oh, no. I sort of came in thinking it'd be very hospitally, yeah. very sterile, very grey yeah. and bland, and you just sort of don't. White walls. And, white walls. You know, but this yeah. has such a luxurious, grand yeah. feel about it's like a hotel. it. Exactly like a yeah. hotel. Carla came here after a fall. Does this place feel like you're at home? Home, home is home. But this is like a great down from home. That's what, let's put it that way. Here, yes, I'm comfortable. 
But uh, you always miss your home and everything because that's where you are independent. <laughs> There's a lot going on here for residents and plenty of daily activities and my mum doesn't do any of this. I've never seen anything like it. I thought it would be like a clinical sort of place, you know, white walls and, you know, very hospitalised sort of thing. But it wasn't, it was like being in a, in a home. And the smells, the decor, the, you know, the catering for the Asian community is really, really good. Definitely coming here has made me think that actually looking into a care home um, isn't as scary as it was an hour ago. Yeah. This place has opened our eyes. Care homes offer a lot to people like Carla, but like she said, home is still home. And despite everything, I know deep down my mum wouldn't be happy here. Who are they? I can't see their faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ranjit. But it has inspired me to spend more time with her. That's Auntie Tahira. But who's the one in the middle? Bajani Auntie. She's gone. She's gone now. Bajani Auntie. And I'm trying to spend some quality time with my mother. But it's not easy because she's always swearing at me or shouts at me and stuff. But that's my mum. That's her character. She's, uh, she's feisty. <laughs> I think it's difficult for my mother as well because she's bedridden. And when she tells the kids off, when they come round, it's oh yeah, I start shouting. She can't get out, get up and chase them, or grab them and give them a, give a slap. Can I say that? <laughs> okay. This one. Where? Yeah, yeah. Hudge. It's nice hearing stories about mum though. It really is. And I come out and I take the stone after him through it. <laughs> you threw stones at them. Yeah, so that's it. No more. Well, I think she's gone more insular since dad passed and he's no longer there. And even when they're like fighting with each other, he was still there. And even when they were getting the walking sticks out and they were both doing like, almost like sword fights in the front living room, it, it's been very difficult for her because it has always been just dad, who's basically the love of her life. Looking through old photos is all very well, but I want to do more with my mum. So I've got in touch with a mate who might be able to help. So, Helen, when you were younger, what job did you have? I was a shorthand typist oh. in an architect's department in the Ayrshire County Council. What is it that you wish that people understood? Rihanna has got a knack of getting people to open up. In just a few minutes, the whole room has come to life. He was interested in canals and got me interested in canals. And I went to the doctors one time. And I said to him, will I be all right with this? He said, you should have been dead twice. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice hearing people's stories, and they obviously really enjoy it. Cliff is 98 and got a wicked sense of humour. What's your favourite activity? Sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Conversation costs nothing, but it's the, it's the one thing that will make somebody feel so important and special, especially when they've lost a lot. How many times do you actually ask your mum about herself? How many times do you actually ever talk to her? Hardly any. You could even just read out the news of the day, say, Mum, God, look at this. And very just, subtle, isn't it? Very subtle. It, yeah. That's the key. Mm. It's got to be really subtle. Don't talk about emotional things. Just very casual questions about the things that are important to them. So what sort of hobbies did you have? Rihanna's got some really good ideas that I can try with my mum. They clearly work well in the care home. But wouldn't they rather be with their families? Your daughter and your son, did they ever think about looking after you in their own homes? Well, they probably did, but I didn't want them to. Why? I wanted to be independent. I didn't want to spoil their lives and I didn't want them to sort of be able to stay at home and look after me. I want them to get out and have a good life and do what they want. You know, how did you come to this care home? The care home, because I... Our cultures are very different. You know what I've realised? That it's not for me to say who's right or wrong. It's about what works best. I've discovered care comes in many forms. And it's much more than just hot dinners and a comfy bed. So we've come up with an idea which we hope will lift Mum's mood. My brother Yusuf brought this parrot 
to give my mum some companionship. He's such a nuisance, but we love him. I don't know, he's just warm to us. So every day, Toto needs to have fresh food and water because he eats like a horse. Toto, come on, dinner time, din dins. My mum loves a parrot. She can't sit here watching TV all day. She needs something to be live and direct sort of thing, something, you know, in the room, not just the screen. And it's, uh, he's brilliant. He's cheered up a lot. When he's, when he's in the cage, when I come home, she will say, open, let him out. So I have to let him out and just goes flying around. She loves it. He sits on her lap, sits on her leg. She shouts at him. It's like one of the kids. Our parrot has definitely put a smile on mum's face. And I'm trying my best to make her feel happier now dad's gone. And I've been thinking about him a lot, especially with my play. Who would have thought that my life as a football hooligan would have become a successful theatre production? The opening night of the curve, my play, I mean, it was so emotional. It was, it was great. I loved it. Shame my parents didn't come to see him. My, my dad would have loved it. I'm sure he'd have loved it. He would have felt proud to see part of his life and my life on stage, you know, in front of crowds every night, standing ovations every night, you know. This is something I'll never forget. I just wish my parents could have been here with me. And now, I'm bringing my own family to a special place that's close to my heart. Skegness brings a lot of memories back for me. I mean, my dad, when he brought us here years ago, it was nice there. Although it was very, very short, but it always, that's always in my head. I'll never forget that moment. So what about me? I'm not getting any younger. I'd like to know what my kids think about it all. Are they going to look after mum and dad, like I've done? Over the last year or so, whilst making this documentary, this film, it's opened my eyes. I've seen care homes, I've seen people look after their parents. And I was wondering about you guys, whether you're going to look after me or put me in a care home. Of course we're going to look after you, I mean... You seem like you're not very keen about it. <laughs> Might shove you in a care home eventually. No, I'm joking. You better not do. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, of course we'll look after you. Mine's are good care homes. I don't mind if you do... I don't mind, it's your decision, because you're going to be... You're going to have your own family, you have your own kids, you have a lot of you're going to be working. It's not going to be easy looking after me. At the end of the day, you guys have done so much for us, it would be wrong for us not to look after you. I know I'm asking a lot from them because they're going to have their own lives. And it is going to be a lot of pressure on them. But life is difficult, it's not easy, it's not a bed of roses. Whatever you do, it's a tough decision, whether it's at home or in a home. There's no easy answer, to be honest with you. I mean, it's up to the individual, up to their families. Time's precious. You only got a little bit left. So make the most of it. <laughs>